By God's great mercy, we have been given new birth. Birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Birth into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading. Even if we have had to suffer various trials, in faith we rejoice. And one day the validity of our faith will be revealed. So as we await Christ's coming, we love him. And even though we do not see him now, we believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For the outcome of faith is the salvation of your souls. Well, good morning and welcome to our shared online worship this Sunday. It's great to have you with us and uh, as ever, it's wonderful to greet people from right across our Northwestern Baptist family and indeed beyond. And particularly this week, it's been lovely to hear from the church down in Tawin in the beautiful Mid Wales who are joining with us in these acts of worship and also to say hello to uh, the church at Hollingwood, uh, Beulah, who I know quite a few folk from there are, are in touch with us as well. So thank you for your messages of encouragement and we'll keep offering you these services for as long as we can. So let's now centre our hearts on our call to worship as we sing as best as we can together. Now is the time to worship, again assisted and led by our friends in the Northern Baptist Association. <laughs> Loving and gracious God, we come together again as your people and seek your presence. We thank you because in your great mercy you have given us new birth into a living hope. Because we do have an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading. 
that even though as a world and as a nation we are in a place of trial and of struggle, we can fix our eyes on you. We can set our bearings on eternity and we can come together to declare afresh our faith and our trust in you. You are the creator of our world. You have made all things good. And however distorted, however damaged our world may be, we can see your goodness still stamped within it. And we can trust in you, a good and loving God, that whatever happens to us, however circumstances affect us, we are secure in you. We come together not to escape the realities that are facing us at the moment, but to find you in them and to find your way through them as you walk at our side at, in whatever the journey might entail. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for those events that we have recently celebrated that remind us again that you have come into our world, that you have lived and you have died to show us the extent of your love for us. And because of what you have done on a cross, we know that our salvation is secure in you. We don't pretend for a moment that we have earned that salvation and we recognise that we are undeserving of it. And we admit and we confess all of those human weaknesses, all of those ways in which we fall short of your glory that are part and parcel of who we are. We can't pretend that we are any different except that you have made us different. You have declared us righteous. You have put right the things that are wrong, not because of anything we are or have deserved, but because of what you have made us. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray not only as we focus ourselves on you in this act of worship, but as we go through our lives day by day, that you will continue to do your work within us, that you will sanctify us, that you will help us to grow more and more into the likeness of Christ. Yes, that even the circumstances we face at the moment, for all the trouble and the trial that they may entail, that we will also see these as an opportunity to show ourselves to be like you and equipped by your spirit that we may indeed be declarers of good news in our words and our deeds as we journey together through these times. So as we take time to centre our lives afresh on you, may we truly know that we have met with you and that you are with us in every circumstance. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, over the weeks, I've made no secret of my appreciation of both the talent and the generosity of the people from Resound Worship. And this week, I'd invite you to join with a song by Chris Juby based on Psalm 100, Worship the Lord.
Well, I'm joined now by Laura Quigley, who is one of our NWBA trustees, and she's also secretary at our church at Laird Street, but she is also the director for quality and patient safety on Wirral NHS, so very much part of our front line at the moment. And also Keith Parr, who for a number of years now has been minister at McGull Baptist. Uh, Laura, I'm going to talk to you first of all. Um, your secretary at Laird Street. Um, I know some of the folk from Laird Street have been joining us in these online services. How is everyone there? How are people in your community? Yeah, morning, Phil. Uh, thanks for asking me to uh, join you today. Um, yeah, we're, we're holding up okay in, in Laird Street. We've got um, a couple of things going on to try and make sure that we're still connected as a church. Uh, we've set up our um, WhatsApp group. Uh, of which there's lots of encouragement and messages going backwards and forwards there so that's, that's really helpful of course we listen into our uh, Sunday mornings with you as well and, and the team so it's, it's great to be able to to be part of, of the service today as well and also as well we we do uh, we have got a sort of a leadership team that makes sure that we keep keep connected um, because not everybody is used to social media like using Facebook or, or WhatsApp so we also make sure that we um, telephone our most vulnerable uh, within our congregation as well and ensure that they're all, all connected. Uh, as I say mostly what we're finding is that people are, are holding up and, and doing very well um, so you know we're, we're pleased with that. 
That's great. I know that um, the church at Lowe Street, I mean, you've always had a very strong focus on your local community in the way that you've, you've gone about being church. I guess that must be quite difficult for you at the moment because you, you haven't got that ability to just reach into the community around you in the way that you'd normally do. Yeah, that that's right. Um, what we are doing though as well is is keeping an eye on on church buildings. So we do have people sort of going in and making sure that things are safe there. And again, it's just sort of although people can't come into the church, even just people visiting and making sure that things are okay, keeping it open at times while while we're checking, just shows that we are still alive. Um, and yeah, you know, it, it is about how we make sure that we continue to pray for our community, um, but also as well look at how we can connect through our newspapers and our leaflets and different things that we can actually go out into the street and still do those things as well. So it's doing, it's still trying to remain connected, but it's looking at being connected differently rather than the face to face that we're so used to. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, I heard at one of our churches in Accrington, we've put a washing line up in the church grounds and people can peg their prayer requests as they go past for their morning that's exercise. Fantastic. Uh, and it's that kind of innovative thing that just reminds people we're still there for them, which yeah. I, know, I know is important. Now, Lorna, I mean, you of all people, you've been affected by coronavirus probably for longer than most of us, not, not because you've suffered from it, but because of the work you do on the Wirral. You were part of, mm. of putting together the first quarantine centre at Arrow Park, yeah. uh, which must have been yeah. a, a piece of work for you. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Um, so if I'm sure people recall, um, we did have um, initially 90 guests uh, that arrived from the province of, of Wuhan uh, and they um, landed in Bryce Norton and were transported and stayed up with us for 14 days. Then we had a second cohort as well, uh, which if people remember, they were people who were on the, the cruise ship that was um, docked for quite a while I think it was Hong Kong wasn't it or um but they were they were docked as well so yeah um some of that I think we probably practiced and we we um certainly had a little bit of a forerunner of, of what coronavirus can do um I think what was different in those cases was although it was an emergency situation and, and again I you know I think the NHS and social care and partners worked extremely well together those cohorts of people were relatively well people and thankfully none of them um, were positive or tested positive uh, for COVID-19 uh, and their experiences were, were very good of which we're, you know, we're, we're grateful to everybody who did everything about it. Um, now we're in a very different situation because it feels that COVID is very real uh, and we are having uh, a lot of people diagnosed across the North West. Uh, and we are seeing uh, deaths and uh, fatalities due to that. Uh, and I think it is making things a lot, a lot real for, you know, a lot real for us, really. Um, I was just saying earlier to, to colleagues um, that this year, 2020, is the International Year of the Nurse. And that's been de designated by the World Health Organization. And back in January, I uh, contacted my nursing colleagues to say how much congratulations on, on being a nurse and so much looking forward to working and celebrating this year. How I, little I knew where the nurse's role would be going in this year, that nurses are doing remarkable things in really unusual circumstances. Uh, I, th I just feel really proud to, to be a nurse at, at this time and, and also to be part of, of the NHS family, which I've, you know, I've worked for the NHS for 35 years now. I'm just so proud to be part of that that wider community. Still looking in the news that we have seen uh, to date, 32 NHS um, who have died whilst you know while serving and, and looking after patients. That ranges from doctors, nurses, but also technicians and porters as well. So it's people on the front line who you know are really looking after people and. Um, you know their lives are being affected by that and their families lives and it's interesting that because uh keith if i could just bring you in for a moment you're going to pray for us uh, uh, in a few minutes and, and pray for people like lorna out on the front line but it's kind of 
beginning to change the way we see things almost you know the kingdom of god speaks about the first being last and the last yeah. being first and we're suddenly beginning to recognize that that some of the jobs that perhaps have not been given the value they should are, are beginning to be recognized for what they are at the moment <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and to me, uh, I guess, um, looking at this, is it's Jesus at work. It's, you know, Jesus came and turned the world on its head, and it's happening again. The kingdom of God is alive, and it's kicking. Um, I, I suppose the challenge for the church and the challenge for society after this, don't be so bold to speak this way, but will be to maintain this, to recognise that the people that clean, clean our hospitals, that clean our schools, the teachers who have gone in and are looking after those who are on the front line. Uh, the, the guys who push the trolleys uh, in hospitals are, as every, uh, are just as valuable as the doctors mm -hmm. who uh, we look on as being top of the tree, so to speak. And, um, uh, and it will be really interesting, I think, to see how, um, uh, how the narrative changes mm -hmm. over the next few months. And I think the church has got a voice there as well, because we're, we're here to serve the, uh, the broken and the deserted and, and those that feel hopeless and helpless. That is why we exist in what you could argue, to, to bring the kingdom of God into those people's lives. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting one when, when, when this ends and it will end. <laughs> Let's not forget, we, this is not a permanent state we're in. Um, it'd be really interesting to see how everyone's language changes. Yeah. And Lorna, I mean, you're out there in this front line. How, how is it for people at the moment and how can we pray for you and, and for your colleagues yeah. and for others at this time? Sure. It is, it is tough for people. Um, you know, despite being in healthcare, people are still frightened um, because we're dealing with, you know, with, with sometimes the, the unknown. Uh, we see on the news as well that um, there have been shortages around what's called PPE, which is uh, personal protective equipment. Um, people, are, people are scared, but at the same time, people are still uh, wanting to do their best. Um, this morning, I, I took the dog uh, for a walk and I walked past a, a, a care home uh, by me and I must have been going, it was around about 10 to 8, so it must have been a, a shift handover. And I saw there was about cars coming in and taxis coming in and people being dropped off. And there was about five members of staff entering that building around 10 to 8, you know, this morning. And I just shouted over to them and sort of said, thank you for what you're doing and stay safe. And walked away and, and prayed for them as I, as I walked away. Um, these are people who are, who are going in and caring for our most vulnerable people. And we do focus on the NHS and we do focus on doctors and nurses and they are very important. But I think as Keith said about turning, you know, things are being turned on its head. I think we should think about what I would describe really as the only people. How many times when, when we talk to people and we say, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm only a cleaner. I'm only a shop assistant. I'm only a, a delivery driver. These people are absolutely critical and they're, you know, they're absolutely coming to the fore in their everyday job of what they're doing to keep us safe. And I think we should just give thanks and be so grateful to these people. And they are enabling the doctors and the nurses and the healthcare assistants and those people on the front line to keep us going by delivering our food, by doing the things that we need. So I think we should be grateful to all. Yeah, and I think as well, we, we, we notice, uh, maybe we don't notice that many are, are also having to work in very new ways. I mean, my mum's in a care home and, you know, we, we've now got this ability um, that the care home said, oh, if you need to Skype her, we'll just take the computer over. And, and of course, trying to get my mum to, you know, to don't put it next to your ear, mother. You've got to, but, but actually you realise that this is over and above all the usual really high level care that, that these folk are giving her, that they're all, they're having to get their heads around Skype mm -hmm. and all the rest of it and do the kind of thing that we've been doing this morning as you know Keith's been struggling to get his microphone to work and all those real things that they're, they're, they're delivering high quality care and all this other stuff mm. as well and, and I love that sense of the only people um, uh, again I was list listening to the news the other day and they were in one of the schools and one of the youngsters said my my mum is a till operator and my dad's a bin man and I'm proud of them and I thought isn't it great that we're recognizing the value 
of, of those. Keith, you've, I mean, you've also, I don't know whether you've been diagnosed with COVID-19, but you certainly went through the symptoms uh, for a while. Um, you are asthmatic, so you're one of those people who's vulnerable. Um, and so in many respects, you, you and Lorna may want to have a longer conversation later. <laughs> But I mean, you, you, you know, you, you know what it feels like to live with the reality of this as, as someone who is vulnerable and yeah. everything we've heard. I just wonder whether you'd lead us this morning in our prayers of intercession uh, to pray for those in the front line, to pray for those who today will be keeping those bedside vigils on behalf of others. And well, pray as God leads you. Please pray for us. I'd absolutely love to. Let's pray, shall we? ministers you love to use words and to speak so this morning i thought it would be good if we had some moments of silence and quiet so that we can offer our own prayers and from our hearts to our father god who promises to hear us when we pray and so risen jesus we say thank you for all those who serve us we thank you lord for those that you have placed in places where they have physically become good news. We thank you for all of those who are on the front line uh, of this uh, virus. And Lord, all of us know someone who works in a care home or is a cleaner or is uh, sacrificing time and indeed themselves. And so in this moment of silence, this moment of quiet, Bring to mind those that uh, you know are putting themselves in harm's way and give thanks to God for them and pray for their protection. We've spoken this morning, Lord, of the only people of uh, a society where we are judged by what we do. And Father, it brings to mind the fact that to you, there are no only people, that we are all loved and all precious in your sight, that we are all so valuable. And so in this time, when we see the first been last and the last been first. We give thanks that we are precious to you. We thank you that in your economy, how much we earn and what we do is an irrelevance. Who we are is what really matters. So we do pray for those who in the past we may have put down and we say that we're sorry and ask for your forgiveness and indeed for their forgiveness. And we would pray, Lord, that you would continue to intervene, continue to be good news to our society, to those who need to hear your voice today. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And the people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Keith. And uh, as ever, I still haven't worked out how to stop notifications happening while people are praying. So I apologize for the, the bing bong there. Uh, but thanks for that, Keith. And, and actually, the conversation we've just had leads us very um, naturally into a song that I found on Facebook, actually. Uh, some of you may remember from many, many years ago, a guy called Dave Bilbra, who was very much at the sort of front line of, uh, of, of Christian music when I was a teenager. And uh, he just put together uh, this very simple song, but I think it says so much about what we've been thinking about. So thank you to Keith. Thank you to, to Lorna. And uh, let's, let's hear from Dave Bilbra. Ah. 
How beautiful are the feet of those who share their skills to stem this tide. Here's to the care workers, nurses and staff doctors fighting this virus attack. Hospital caterers, porters and ward cleaners Piercing our darkest hours with light How beautiful are the feet of those Who share their skills to stem this tide Delivery drivers, shopkeepers and shelf stackers Helping us weather the storm Doing shifts voluntary in this emergency Offering practical help to all How beautiful are the feet of those who share their skills to stem this tide? Frontline practitioners, teachers of key helpers, serving in so many ways, responding unselfishly in local communities. Tirelessly giving themselves each day. Strength them, work through them, we pray. Strength them, work through them, we Strengthen, work through them, we pray. Strengthen, work through them, Lord, we pray. How beautiful are the feet of those On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now Thomas was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You know, when we first began these services, I, I made the point that I wanted us to follow the readings from the Common Lectionary as a way of staying in touch with the same narratives that uh, Christians right across the world would be looking at Sunday by Sunday. And I think I've said on more than one occasion that I found it really quite interesting the way those narratives have spoken right into the circumstances that we're all in at the moment. And today is, is no exception. But what has really made its impact on me is not so much the content of today's reading, though that's obviously very important, but also the timing of today's reading. You know, very often when we read the Bible, we can just turn over a few pages and in, in those few pages we can span decades, if not centuries of history. And, and I wonder if we sometimes forget that, that we're reading this book that tells a story that, that takes place over centuries and centuries and centuries. And, and we, we can sometimes do the same in everyday life. If you've maybe been to see a movie that tells the story of somebody's life and it will cover 20, 30 years and do so in, in less than two hours. It, it's very easy to tell a story very quickly. But today we're almost faced with the opposite. It's a week now since we took and followed that familiar story of the disciples making their way to the empty tomb and we pronounce that Jesus is risen and um, that's all taken place and, and yet the story that we look at today has only moved on just a few hours. So we're almost being invited back to look again at the events we looked at last week. And that got me thinking a little bit. You know, I, I, I love the opportunity that Holy Week gives us to follow the journey of Jesus day by day through the last week of his life and then eventually to Good Friday and Easter Day. But I began to think, do I sometimes, once I've done that, almost take the attitude, well, that's it now, Easter's done and dusted, let's move on, let's get on with the rest of our lives. And for me, it usually means that I'm very quickly involved in, in the final planning for the Liverpool Pentecost Festival. But today we're kind of brought back. And I like that. I like the way the schedule of reading sort of says to us, whoa, hang on a minute. Stay with this story. Just stay with it for a while. Let's just go back and, and look at that day one more time. And in fact, next week, we'll look at it yet again from another perspective. Stay with the story. Well, if there's one year that uh, many of us will have the opportunity to do that and can't really say that we've got too much other stuff to do, this is probably going to be it. So let's look at the story. The disciples are together in a locked room, still trying to make sense of the events of that morning. And there, right there in the room with them, Jesus makes himself present. Now that in itself has a fair bit to say to us at the moment. Because many of us will be engaging in this service in what is a, a very ordinary room. And, and as far as we know, there was nothing particularly special about the room that those first disciples met in. There was no particular purpose in their coming together. They were just doing what people would naturally do in the wake of all the circumstances they were in. And so we may also be in very familiar surroundings, surroundings that are probably more familiar to us in the last four weeks than we would have wished. But Jesus can become present. The risen Jesus can be with us in those ordinary places. And when Jesus becomes present, he does three things. The first is he brings them his peace. He pronounces his peace over them. They're troubled. They're confused people. They're very uncertain about the, the events that they've become caught up in. And he pronounces peace into their troubled situation. He pronounces that peace that he spoke about the night before his crucifixion, the peace that surpasses human understanding, the peace that defies our human circumstances. And Jesus offers us that peace in our ordinary situations today. And the second thing that he brings is reality. Let me explain what I mean by that. He, he shows them his hands and his side. 
And Jesus, in doing that, I would suggest, deals with two really important issues. You know, there are still many people in our world, as there have been throughout the centuries, who just cannot get their heads around, cannot believe that Jesus could die and come back to life. And many of the, the kind of justifications for that will, will form one of two things. Either people will argue, well, maybe Jesus didn't really die. Maybe it wasn't really him. He appeared to die. Or maybe he was so bruised and broken that a different prisoner was crucified and they, they didn't realise it wasn't him. And then Jesus came back. Or, or maybe Jesus didn't rise again. That's the other story. Yes, he did die. But he didn't rise again. They, the, the disciples just kind of were so overwhelmed with grief they thought he'd risen again or, or they, they, they sort of told it as though he rose again through their movement. But that's not what we're told here. Jesus dispels both of those ideas. He shows them his hands and his side. The Jesus that appears before them in the room that night is the same Jesus who was crucified on a Roman execution cross. This isn't some story that they've made up to justify their Christian identity. It really was him. It really had happened. And the story of the later encounter with Thomas just underlines this reality for us. We don't know whether Thomas took him up on the offer of putting his finger in the sword's hole, in, in the spear hole rather. But we know that he showed him the scars, the wounds, the same Jesus who was crucified is the Jesus who appeared risen again. And, and, and one thing that you learn from the resurrection narratives is that those early disciples were in no hurry to form a religious movement. They had no need to make up the story. And they certainly weren't so desperate to see Jesus risen that they somehow deluded themselves into believing that that had happened. They were finding it as difficult as anybody else to believe that Jesus could rise from the dead. Thomas doubts the fact. The, some of the other disciples doubt the testimony of, of the women. They, they didn't just delude themselves into believing this. They found it really hard to believe. And, and many of them, many of the people in the room that night, went on to be executed for what they found out that evening. You don't allow yourself to be executed for a story that you've made up. So Jesus brings peace and Jesus brings reality, but Jesus also brings commission. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You know, when this new millennium dawned, which seems such a, a long time ago now, the leaders of our Baptist Association in the Northwest got together and, and they wanted to begin to ask questions with our churches about what is it that's going to define us in this new era? And it was to this statement of Jesus that they found themselves drawn as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And, and the conclusion they came to was, yeah, this is it. This is the statement that defines us. John chapter 20, verse 21. And, and it came to be known as our 2021 vision. And, and that's very much shaped our shared life together in the Northwest as Baptists and uh, was, was very, very present in, in the process of, of my appointment as regional minister. This is a very significant statement for us. You see, that's because the story is intended to make an impact on us. The story is intended to shape us. Yes, of course, it's something to believe. Yes, of course, it's something that's there to convince us of the foundations of our faith. Yes, of course, it's there to give us peace. And even when everything around us is troubling. But it's also a story that we are commissioned to share. Great, you say. I'm sending you. But we can't go anywhere right now. We all have to stay in, so we can't share the story. OK, but let me ask you a question. And yes, it's a difficult and it's a challenging question. And it's a question I need to ask myself, too. What difference has that actually made? What difference has this period of isolation made? It's been about a month now since we were placed in this national lockdown. So. How many people did you share the story with in the six months before we were all locked down? How much difference has it really made to our telling of the story? Is the biggest barrier to the church's ability to tell this story the fact that 
all our buildings are closed and all our people are in social isolation? Or is it because for other reasons we've lost our enthusiasm for telling the story? Now I'm not going to attempt to answer that question, that's not something I'm going to assume to do. The one thing that I find annoying is when people assume to know what's wrong with me and then preach sermons about it. So I'm not going to do that. But I would invite you to ponder the question for yourself. How much difference has it made? Is social isolation the biggest barrier you face to sharing the story? Is social isolation the biggest barrier I face to sharing the story? And as I reflect on that, and as I reflect on the events that took place that night when Jesus was with his disciples, I'm reminded of my daughter's, my eldest daughter's graduation ceremony. She did a drama degree at York University and we did the whole proud parents thing when she graduated, the cap, the gown, the, the buffet, the, the photographs for the mantelpiece, all of that stuff. And I don't know if you've ever been to one of those graduation ceremonies, but they, they really do operate on an industrial scale. There's one group of people leaving while the next group of people is being stewarded into the room. And uh, they, they'll do three or four departments together to get through this huge volume of student graduations that they need to organise. And so it so happens that my daughter's graduation is all of the drama students and all of the students who've been doing degrees in education. And that was a really interesting combination of people. On one side of the room, you had all these sensible future teachers. And on the other side of the room, you had all these kind of arty types who were going to go on to make plays and do wonderful things in television and all of that stuff. And if I'm honest, even by the way they were dressed, you could kind of tell which half was which. Now, the speaker that day was the famous playwright Simon Stephen, who himself was a graduate of York University. And I'm looking at this incredibly eclectic, this very distinct two groups of people. And I'm thinking, what's he going to say? What's he going to say to these two very different groups of people that can sort of bring them together in, in a common purpose? And actually, he said something quite profound because he saw something that I hadn't seen. And what he said was really quite inspiring. He looked out across the room, this room full of young adults, all decked in their graduation caps and gowns, celebrating their three years of achievement with their lives and careers ahead of them. And he reminded them that they were going into the world as educators and storytellers. Human beings are defined, he said, by the capacity to pass on information to one another and to believe things they cannot see. The stories we tell, he said, and the way we tell them are fundamental to our future. Now, for me, that was a moment of true inspiration. There was so much potential. There was so much possibility in that room. Hundreds of young adults embarking on a journey that had the potential to change the world, equipped and ready. And his words highlighted all of the possibility that was invested in that moment. But as I took that scene in and as I thought about it, the question that came to my mind was, yeah, but what is the story? What is the story that you are going to go out there and share? And in many respects, the moment when Jesus appeared to his disciples was a bit like their graduation ceremony. For three years, they'd embarked on their own journey of learning. They, they'd listened to the words of Jesus. They'd seen what he could do. They'd absorbed something of, of who he was. And now they were told and they were commissioned to go and be the storytellers to go and tell the story. And let's face it, this is a story that has proved its potential to change and define the world. So yeah, we can do no harm by spending some time with our story. But we're not just called to be the recipients of the story. We're called to be the storytellers. And our society needs a story. Not a story to take our mind off what's happening right now, but a story to help make sense of it. A story to give us hope to get through the struggle. Because this story 
is still a story that has the potential to shape the world that emerges from this unimagined chain of events that we now find ourselves in. And as I reflect on the actions and the words of Jesus that evening, it reminds me of how important that moment was and still is for us. And there are four things that emerge for me from it. The first is that Jesus gives them the means of telling the story. Look at my hands and side. Embrace the reality of this. And for all of us right now, I believe the key challenge of the moment is simply to get to know Jesus better. To invest this time that we have to reground and reauthenticate our faith. We can't tell a story that we haven't got to know for ourselves first. And the great thing about this story is that there's always more to discover in it. Spend some time with the story and don't be in too much of a hurry to move on from it. The second thing is he gives us the power to tell the story. He breathed his spirit on them. Now, certainly in my lifetime, I think we might say that the church has perhaps rediscovered something of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. But it does seem to me that an awful lot of the narrative around the Holy Spirit is about the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the manifestations. And, and yes, all those things have their place. But it's interesting to notice that when Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, a few days earlier, again, in that upper room when he shared the Passover meal with his disciples, then he'd spoken of the spirit, not so much as enabling the performance of great miracles and wonders, but helping them in telling the story. The spirit, he says in chapter 14, verse 26, will teach you and remind you what you need to know. The spirit, he says in verse 27, is how you will experience peace in the midst of your trouble. The Spirit, he says in the next chapter, verse 26, it will tell the story through and alongside you as you tell the story. The Spirit will convince those who are wrong and those who are right. The Spirit will be very much at the heart of telling the story. And so we need to be open to be being empowered and equipped by God's Spirit to tell our story today. And the third thing that I would suggest is that we see in this something of how to tell the story. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you, says Jesus. Now, we've already recognised that if Jesus hadn't come from the Father, we'd have no story to tell. If there wasn't for that reality, then there would be no story. But, but that word as also conveys a sense of conformity. And we can hear Jesus saying, I want you to tell the story in the way that I've told the story. Jesus, who is gracious and forgiving and welcoming of the forgotten and the marginalised and not afraid to challenge those who oppress them. Jesus, who is the self-giving, who lives out the story in his decrees, in, in his deeds, in his attitudes. He doesn't just tell the story with words. Jesus, who the Apostle Paul says should be the example that we shape our own attitudes and behaviours by. If we're going to tell this story, then we need not just to know the facts of it. We need to know the person those facts are about. We need to allow his spirit to shape us and mould us. We need to become living examples of this Jesus story. Perhaps there are opportunities while we're not so busy with all the tasks that we've invented in the name of this story to work on becoming a bit more like the person who's at its centre. Tell the story by seeking to be like Jesus. And the fourth thing is that we see something of the purpose of telling the story. Jesus doesn't just land on the stage of human history unannounced. He's been sent by the Father. He's come into the world as the embodiment of the creator of the world. And as many of the New Testament narratives are very keen to remind us, for centuries before, prophets and priests had spoken of his coming. Even the events of history were ingrained with signs that pointed not just to the coming of Jesus, but to the purpose of his coming. Those crowds on Palm Sunday were absolutely right when they said, Hosanna, the God who saves. They may not have realised it at the time, 
they, they may have found it easier to just join in with the next chorus that was crucified a few days later. But God's salvation was coming to pass in Jesus, even if it happened in a way that nobody could have imagined at the time. You and I are here today because someone shared that story with us. A story that we've founded a life of faith on. A story that gives us hope for eternity. And surely if for no other reason, if we have found such hope and purpose in this story, we would want to share that story with others who are seeking that same hope and purpose. So, as Simon Stephen says, human beings are defined by the capacity to pass on information to one another and believe things they cannot see. And Jesus says those of us who've believed that story are blessed because we believe things that we haven't seen. We may not have been in the room, but we're part of the commission. The stories that we tell and the way that we tell them, says the playwright, are fundamental to our future. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, said one of the Old Testament prophets. How beautiful are the storytellers of hope and yes, we thank God for those who bring good news into our society at the moment as that song from Dave Bilbrow reminded us we need to learn to weave our story into the good things that they are doing. But as we revisit the story of the risen Jesus, so he makes this unavoidable invitation and commission. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Let's pray together. Risen, living Lord Jesus, help us to embrace again the profound story of your death and resurrection. Write it deep within us that we may be those who, convinced by its truth, are compelled to share it. By your Holy Spirit, equip us to share it with clarity and to live lives that reflect the one in whose name we speak, so that your purposes may be fulfilled and through us others may come to hear your story of hope and salvation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with us today. I hope that you found this service of benefit and blessing to you on your Christian journey. And we finish with uh, a song, a well-known song uh, by um, Stuart Townend, sung again for us by the Northern Baptist Association that reminds us of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who journeys with us as we seek to live and to tell the story. May God bless you and may God be with you in this week.